What up? Welcome back to the Criss Cross Corner. This is Chris Canty, and today I will be beginning a series on key figures that impacted the way Detroit looks and operates today. I'm going to call it the Impact Series, all right? The Detroit Impact Series. I like that name better. But before we get started, join the Criss Cross Corner Facebook group. That's the only way you get to see the live show on Tuesday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you don't watch the live show, listen to the podcast release on Wednesdays on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and of course, the Anchor app. Follow us at Crisscross Corner on Instagram. DM us news stories to talk about and top 10 list topics. We do a top 10 list at the end of each show. Usually they're about music or movies. So uh, for example, top 10 songs of 2019, top 10 songs of 2020, uh, stuff like that. So submit your ideas for the top 10 list. Uh, Your uh, list might make the podcast. So anyway, support the podcast with $5 a month on the Anchor app anchor.fm slash crisscross corner. Uh, go to that link, click the support button and make your donation. Your donation helps sustain future episodes of the podcast. The first entry in the impact series is going to be a man named Frederick Law Olmsted. Have you ever walked through a city park and wondered why the trees were so strategically placed along the sidewalk? Either it being social, political, or economic, strategic park planning and placement is beneficial to the well-being, well-being, I cannot speak today, well-being of a city. Not only is this a place for people to relax, it is a place for people to congregate peacefully. In all the craziness, People can come together regardless of their race and socioeconomic status. One person who could believe in this ideology while creating delightful parks was the famous Frederick Law Olmsted. Frederick Law Olmsted is arguably America's most important landscape architect. His contributions to the field and to the American environment are amazing. All right. In addition to his monumental career as a designer, Olmsted was an extremely influential writer, journalist, and social reformer. His marvelous work extends from New York City's Central Park to, of course, what we're talking about today. Uh, we're going to talk about Belle Isle Park in Detroit. Olmsted's ideas related to cities and urban development has made him an urban planning legend. His ideology towards social equality has inspired many planners to engage in intercommunity cohesiveness. There is no doubt that Frederick Law Olmsted has left the legacy in urban planning. So we're going to go through his little bit of his history. So born in 1822, Olmsted pursued many jobs before his death in 1903. He was a gentleman farmer in New York and Connecticut in the 1840s, interested in scientific agriculture. He became one of the most popular travel writers of the next decade, renowned for his detailed observations of Southern life. His observations of Southern life carried him, carried with him to cities of the North, It is there where he finds his second calling, civil service. So he was born in 1822. So by the time he was in his 20s and 30s, the Civil War kind of happened. So, you know, (laughs) you know. Uh, During the Civil War, he became, uh, he enlarged his reputation by serving as the executive secretary of the United States Sanitary Commission. He and he continued to expel civil service uh, reform through the Gilded Age. Olmsted and his lust for cleanliness and order 
gave him recognition as the person to call if you need someone to revive a dying area and keep it clean and permanent. Hence the name landscape architect and urban planner. Indeed, of course, Olmsted was a genius when it came to landscape architecture, as I said many times before. Most geniuses are born with a gift and then master their gift over time. Olmsted luckily lived in the United States when planners and officials wanted to make the cities attractive and more livable. Because the 1880s, I think it was the tail end of the Industrial Revolution in the United States. And then people were starting to be like, hey, I think we need to flush our toilets. <laughs> I think our streets need to be clean. <laughs> um, I mean, moving into uh, the 1900s, more cities were becoming more cleaner. But this is back in the 1800s, so we're going to stick there. This is back when stuff was still, was still kind of nasty. So... He pretty much invented the new profession of landscape architecture. Uh, his style and his vision is very unique, all right? And the examples I'm about to tell you are going to be you're like, oh, he did that? What? His vision is very unique and it lives forever. Um, every aspect of the parks and buildings that he helped design and strategically place were intentionally designed to create an extraordinary aesthetic experience. It's crazy how these visions came to be, but the anomaly was uh, that Frederick Olmsted had the ideas that people didn't know what they wanted. So it's like, fam, you're saying what you want, but it goes right there because that's, it's, not what you think you want, it's what you don't know what you want. And I got you. That's what he said. <laughs> um, his resume would be definitely, you know, a few pages. I'm not going to go through everything he did, but uh, he did so much for the urban planning community to look back on. Even his best known accomplishments as a landscape architect suggest a man of impressive uh, resolve and resourcefulness. Okay, so I'm just going to put this out here right now before we go on. He was the co-designer of Central Park, all right, in New York City, the first great American urban park. He was head of the first Yosemite Commission. He was the leader of the campaign to protect Niagara Falls. He was the designer of the U.S. Capitol grounds and West Front Terrace. Okay. Uh, he was a site planner for the Great White City of the uh, 18, not 19, 1893 World Columbian Exposition. He was the planner of Boston's Emerald Necklace. Um, and, of course, we're going to talk about this later. Uh, he was one of the, he was the key, a main designer and architect of landscapes of Belle Isle in Detroit, Michigan. Okay. Uh uh, I guess I could talk about five of his contributions, I guess, in this episode. The first, of course, everybody wants to, you know, wants me to talk about this. Talk about Central Park, Chris. It's so great. All right, I'll talk about it. First is Central Park in New York City. Uh, Central Park is by far Olmsted's most famous project. It was actually the first park he designed, actually. Believe it or not. Uh, this began a 15-year collaboration with his co-designer, English architect Calvert Faux. The success of this design quickly gave the two men a national reputation as park planners. To begin, um, to begin talking about uh, New York City and Central Park is a whole other uh, conversation because the city is just... Um, a standard, I guess, in urban planning. As you, you say New York City, Chicago, Portland. Um, they're really good examples of planning at its best. Planning at its worst, you would go to LA, Houston, usually Southern, like Southern Belt cities or younger cities. Um, 
I want to say like poor as in it's bad, but it's like compared to cohesive cities. Ugh. Lordy, lordy, lordy. But back on subject, to get a better picture, the area of the park is located, which Central Park is located between 59th and 110th Street on Manhattan. Uh, with the park covering 51 blocks of land, the park dominates the island, dividing the island into the four different recognizable areas that New Yorkers use and say every day. Okay, You have uh, north of Central Park, which is, of course, Harlem, north of 110th Street and the prestigious Columbia University to the Northwest. Uh, to the South of Central Park is the skyscraper dominated Midtown, which, you know, Midtown is Midtown. You got Billionaire's Row, you have uh, Empire State Building, Chrysler Building, uh, the new uh, Hudson Yards development, you have Madison Square Garden and Grand Central Station, as well as the Chrysler Building and Fifth Avenue. All right. Uh, to the west, Upper West Side, of course, uh, famous for the Ghostbuster movies and the cell the television series Seinfeld, and it is home to the American Museum of Natural History, which is shown in Nat at the Museum, which I have been to. It is amazing. You should go. Shout out to the American Museum of National History. Uh, natural History. I can't speak today, y'all. Uh, on West 81st Street. And to the east, we have the Upper East Side, home to the Guggenheim Museum and the upper middle class of Manhattan. One needs to actually visit Central Park to understand the unmeasured energy and devotion to such a task. Because that's a lot of land to design. All right. Olmsted's 20 years of involvement with Central Park engaged him in more aspects of his design and operation than did any of his other parks. Because it's huge. Central Park is amazingly, amazingly huge. The act of making the plan was simply a first step to be followed by a daily dedication to directing the execution of the thousands of daily Thousands of details, I cannot speak. Thousands of details by <laughs> which the design was to be realized and maintained. No other park offered the same exhausting opportunity for the exercise of the whole range of his talents. While uh, Manhattan Central Park was in the books, uh, Olmsted, you know, moved, you know, he moved around, he did all this stuff. Like I listed earlier, he was part of everything. He had, uh, he had, he had many hats. All right, he was in everything. So with uh, Manhattan Central Park in the books, Olmsted looked to Detroit to implement the blueprints for his next grand scale park. Yes, Detroiters. We're talking about Belle Isle Park. Olmsted began to uh, plan out Belle Isle in the fall of 1881. His solution to Belle Isle was to emphasize the existing landscape conditions of the site. So instead of changing everything, bulldozing and excavating and doing all that stuff and say, get rid of this, put this in here. He said, hold up, this is amazing. Let's keep this, but make a park that emphasizes this stuff to get a, a better aesthetic, to give a more natural aspect to an urban jungle that would come later in the century. Um, he based his design on the large area of existing woods covering. Uh, he claimed that the area uh, larger than the wooded areas were, it was just, I was like, he was, um, he was amazed. Like keep this stuff. Like Central Park has a lot of trees as well. However, you know, a lot of stuff had to be taken out because it was a huge swamp. But Belle Isle was different. We're going to talk about that in a second. Uh, the major natural condition that Olmsted had to deal with on Belle Isle was the swampy character. Okay, um, In order to make the site usable for a park and to guard against the danger of malaria, because there's a lot of mosquitoes, swamps, standing water, ugh, he proposed a canal stream that ran the length of the island. The sole remaining element of his proposed water system is the loop canal at the western end. 
where canoeists still make the circuit that, you know, you know, it's still there to this day. People, people do it. People uh, canoe. I mean, I did last year as well, but people don't know that I did, but I kind of snuck in there. But anyway, the Loop Canal is still there and you can do it today. Not really today because it's cold, but in the summertime when it's warmer, thanks to the Department of Natural Resources. Thank you, DNR. I used to work for them. Uh, today, the park has a network of roads that showcase the most attractive views of the city. Uh, I go there pretty much when I'm bored or when I need some good inspiration because that is a, an amazing view of Detroit. Uh, this was inspired by Olmsted's drive to preserve natural spaces and create roadways that showcase them. If you drive on Belle Isle today, there's a bridge. You drive down the bridge, you look to your right, it's the Detroit skyline. You get on the island, there's a huge clock, uh, clock hill. Uh, it's a huge hill with a clock in it, and there's flowers in it, like to do like you know the different times, 12, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, and all that stuff. When you turn right, you see the entire Detroit skyline. However, it's behind this row of trees going along the street, and it goes all the way around for like, I think it's like three miles of road around the whole thing, but it's an amazing view. So if you come to Detroit, check it out. You'll be amazed. You'd be like, Frederick Olmsted did this. All right. Anyway, Frederick Olmsted is known for his innovations to the urban landscape. Uh, the most influential um, innovation was, of course, the parkway. Okay. As proposed by Olmsted, it would provide a continuous public pr public pleasure that kept the character of the neighborhoods. We're going to go from Detroit and back to New York City. Instead of Manhattan, we're going to Brooklyn. The first parkway would be developed in Brooklyn in 1868. Olmsted uh, proposed a series of boulevards running through the major residential sections of the city. These parkways would connect public recreation grounds and would also extend the amenity of park-like green space throughout the city. The utilization of existing landforms as elements in the cityscapes, rather than reducing the, world, the whole to a flat checkerboard of squares and rectangles was one of the most consistent themes. So when you go through Brooklyn, you see um, the different boulevards. I forgot what their names were because I don't live there, but <laughs> uh, all of those roads that connect to like many parks, like Prospect Park and the other parks that go down along those things, that was all Frederick Law Olmsted, guys. It's amazing. The final contribution that Olmsted did uh, he planned the US Capitol after you know the big you know the 1700s on the early 1800 people did it uh, DC needed a, a facelift and Olmsted helped him out Olmsted planted uh, many new trees in an oval. Yeah, because everybody knows about about, uh, about DC, how it's shaped. If you drive around, it's a huge oval. Um, and then you have the mall, as well as the White House and the State Capitol building at the other side. Um, the Supreme Court's also on that side as well. But um, he leveled the ground. So he was like, all right, get rid of this, all right? <laughs> Because the DC was hilly and it was very, very like swampy. So he leveled the ground, he enriched the soil, and installed a drainage system before replanting the area. So, uh, the US Capitol is at the base of the mall, like I said, uh, and it's shaped like uh, Central Park, believe it or not. It is by far the landmark to see when you go to DC, because that's where everybody goes when they go to DC. Uh, Olmsted is also uh, credited to, for designing the gardens and the terrace around the Capitol building, which is also a really great uh, tourist spot as well. Uh, every aspect of Capitol Hill 
was visioned by Olmsted. However, a major concern was the visual presentation of the Capitol. In the outer section of the grounds, Olmsted planted enough trees to conceal the Capitol building until it could be seen from the best vantage points. These four diagonal views from which the full facade of the building is visible. On the west side, he provided a viewing point from the drive and path by means of a break in the barrier of trees. So when you drive around, I've done this, drive around like there's the corner streets go into the, uh, the Capitol building. So driving down, wrap around the corner, the row of trees that are there, you go around the trees and then there's just trees and then boom, Capitol building. However, if you're on those diagonal streets going straight into the Capitol, all you see is the Capitol building, the Capitol building with a row of trees alongside you, like the boulevards and parkways of Brooklyn, matched with the mall uh, designed by Holmes as well, looking like Central Park, and the trees with a huge, with a great view of the huge Capitol building, as in just like the um, view in Detroit on Belle Isle. All these things are coming together. There is a there is without a shadow of a doubt that Frederick Law Olmsted was motiv uh, motivated by a strong belief in democracy. He felt that Americans deserved diverse uh, areas and that they needed to be brought together on common ground. His contribution to social activism movements during this time and far after his time placed him on the Mount Rushmore of planning in the United States. Part of the significance of his contribution stems from the social vision that he brought to his profession uh, in, the, in its formative years. Before he finally settled on landscape architecture for his life's work, he played a role in several social movements of the day. Okay. The emerging synthesis of mid 19th century reform suggests a fresh interpretation of Olmsted's social thought, new systems for moral instruction and the dissemination of knowledge in common schools, high schools, Sunday school, and even factories and art galleries implanted uh, middle-class mores. After writing about beautiful places and being an ex uh, executive secretary for sanitation reform, Olmsted seemed a little bit OCD when it comes to perfection. All right. Not only did he want perfection aesthetically, he wanted perfection socially as well. All right. So Olmsted's connection with the reformist uh, Gentry, 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 Gentry. I don't know. Comment below what you guys call it. Uh, uh, his <laughs> connection with the reformist Gentry was not a matter of coincidence or chance. He shared their assumptions about the design of a good society where hierarchy, difference, and skilled leadership might impose tranquility on a contentious egalitarian people. He disliked the headstrong ideological fantasism of both abolitionist extremists and evangelical Protestant secretarians in the 1850s. Olmsted is illuminating. Uh, he's an illuminating example of mid 19th century cultural critics who feared that the nation was deficient in necessary qualities of harmony, balance, and disciplined ordered progress. By the late 1860s, which is after the Civil War, Olmsted had become convinced that the United States faced grave dangers of fragmentation symptomatic of a society in a rudimentary frontier stage of development. Oh boy, we're talking about the Civil War going into Reconstruction, going into the Jim Crow stuff, going into all the stuff that we know about today. Um, Olmsted, like other Americans of the day was scared of the new trend of the nation. Because like I said earlier, America was primarily rural in the, in the 1700s, early 1800s. 
However, going into the mid and late 1800s, going into the 1900s, uh, this new trend, as all urban planners know, and historians and other people who should know about this, stuff happened in cities that was inevitable. Urbanization happened. Instead of having natural stuff like trees and nice little parks with grass, cities were growing larger and were transforming farmland into concrete cityscapes. The 1850s and 1860s and 1870s saw the growth of Eastern urban centers as a result of railroad expansion. Okay. Olmsted was concerned about the increasingly artificial environment and the debilitating increase in the pace of life that seemed endemic to the metropolis. He believed that modern technology and science made the large city a safe place to live. And he foresaw a continued increase in urban size and health. In fact, it was in the city where he found the greatest promise for social advance because that's where everybody comes together, everybody works together from different parts of life, different walks of life, different monies, different families, different everything. They all come together and work together. So Olmsted wanted to keep and maintain green spaces and places for people to enjoy nature through views and sounds. However, the country was not going in that direction. Olmsted was also an activist for the enrichment of young individuals to embrace, e embrace equality. His proposals for better recreational facilities provide the clearest example of the broad program of civilization, of cultural improvement and organized planning. He urged to ensure the country's superiority over Europe because uh, they, oh, Europe wasn't really, you know, homogenous. <laughs> Instead, uh, Olmsted uh, intended his parks to be public institutions of recreation and popular education that would demonstrate the viability of the Republican experiment in America. For example, although Central Park divided communities socially and economically, the park brought people together to create a social harmony that could not be replicated. In the end, Olmsted believe that providing people with opportunities to come together in helpful outdoor settings could encourage a democratic community that uh, could help civilize America. Obviously, it has worked for all these years. Uh, in the rest of his work, designing residential communities and institutions and planning the grounds of single family homes, he sought to promote the values of community and domestically, domesticity uh, that he had earlier defined as the mainstays of America. So pretty much he wanted people to uh, have parks and have natural landscapes to enjoy. However, the country was moving into building stuff, roads, tall buildings, houses with concrete. Um, it just wasn't, it was, it, they were just butting heads. Um, well, today planners are following in Olmsted's footsteps by placing much more emphasis on preserving the natural character of the area and adding outstanding aesthetics to buildings and communities around the world. So today we were talking about Olmsted's contribution and impact to Detroit. Everybody from Detroit knows about Bell Isle Park. If you don't know about Bell Isle Park, if you come to Detroit, a Detroiter should tell you about it. I'm telling you about it right now. If you're listening on the podcast right now and you've never been to Detroit, I'm telling you to go there as soon as you get here. It's an amazing park. And you can thank Frederick Law Olmsted for designing it. All right, before we get out of here, uh, we have a sponsor, we have Mixed Tiles. 
I have a lot of mixed tiles in my room right now. Uh, it is a way for you to express yourself through pictures. Take a picture, put it in the mixed tiles app, shape it up, put it in a frame. It'll ship to you in about a week, maybe two weeks at the most. And you can put it on your wall. Uh, it sticks to your wall because it has a little, like, little adhesive in the back. You can take it off, put it somewhere else on the wall. It's amazing. Okay, I have a few hundred in my room for all my travels that I do around the country and around the world. But you can also do it too, because I want you to have a mixed tile wall with your travel stuff. Uh, the perfect holiday gift from mixed tiles. You can get 10 mixed tiles. Usually 10 mixed tiles cost about $110, which is a lot of money, especially for the holidays. But mixed tiles is giving you a gift. 10 mixed tiles for $70. Yes, I said it, $70. Get your holiday shopping done early and give the gift of beautiful memories with mixed tiles. Use the promo code and order today, Mary 2020 That's M-E-R-R-Y, all caps, 2020, and get 10 mixed tiles for $70 unless you want to spend that extra 40 and pay for $110. That could have been $40 you could have gave to me <coughs> on, the, on the Anchor app, but it's okay. Use the promo code Mary2020 on Mixed Tiles to get your memories put on your wall for the rest of your life. Mixed Tiles. Or you can go to mixedtiles.com and you can pretty much Put any picture you have in your camera roll onto your wall. It's amazing. Let's get creative, folks. Uh, and that has been another edition of the Criss Cross Corner. Please join the Criss Cross Corner Facebook group uh, to watch the live show on Tuesdays. Subscribe to the podcast on Spotify or Google Podcast or Apple Podcasts. Leave a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts. Uh, tell your friends and family about the podcast. Subscribe to the YouTube channel, Criss Cross Studios. Uh, hit that subscribe button. Click the notification bell for uh, notifications of new videos that we post. Uh, please stay safe, social distance, and be nice to each other. <laughs>